on. Get the stupid mask. Let's not get the letters. Let's go. Church, it is so good to be with you. My name is Ethan Magnus. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're a guest here with us today, man, you are here on a great day. Glad you're here. Uh, we're in the second week of our series, uh, Kappa Delta Pi, but it's sort of like the first week since last week was a snow day, and so about half of us weren't here. We understand. You were shoveling your neighbor's sidewalk. We get it. We appreciate that. Good for you. Glad you're back here with us today. Uh, hey, listen, uh, we are having so much fun with this series. Uh, you know, it's God's frat party. What would life be like if God had a fraternity and everybody was invited? What would it look like to live as a part of that people? And really, like, like nothing I've ever seen, this, this, uh, this theme, this series has just captured our staff. They are just crazy into it. You know, we just finished uh, hiring our children's ministry staff. The whole team's in place now. I went down to their office. They were having a meeting, and I just was totally surprised. This is what I saw. This is our new children's ministry team. Not at all what I expected, but they're apparently, you know, they're having a frat party, and I was a little concerned about them, so I decided I would go pray with our pastoral care team, so I walked down the hall to them, and this is what they're doing, so... I don't even know. Uh, I mean, I, so I needed somebody who wouldn't be caught up in this, you know, Kappa Delta Pi frenzy. I was trying to check in with Peter Nelson. He grew up in this church. He's one of our designers. And he was gone. He was out of town when we kicked off the series. So I thought he would kind of be calm. So I went over to Peter's house to hang out. And this is what I found. And so not at all what I was looking for. I don't know. I'm very concerned. But I just want you to know the leadership of the church in good hands. The rest of us are not getting carried away with this. We are not going to participate I told you not to use that picture. I'm not, what? Did I not say don't? I don't even know. I don't even know what to do. All right, okay. Maybe we're having a little bit of fun. All right. Just to be clear, no togas were actually worn in the making of those pictures. That was Photoshop. I know you couldn't tell, but it's going to be clear. Uh, just to be clear. All right, okay. Seriously, though, we are having a good time. We are having a good time. Uh, not because we're wearing togas, although who knows, that could happen. I, no, no guarantees. Uh, but the, the main reason is because we're letting ourselves just kind of stop, just press pause just for a little second and say, okay, if Jesus wants more from me than just for me to check off a list of beliefs, I want more from me than just kind of say, okay, I'm a Christian, I'm in, you know. But if he actually wants to invite me into a life what would that life be like? What would the rhythms of that life be like? So this Kappa Delta Pi, it's not just three random Greek letters. They actually stand for three words we're going to learn. The first, the Kappa stands for koinonia. Try saying that with me. Say koinonia. Ready? Koinonia. It means fellowship, community. The Delta stands for doulos. Say that with me. Doulos. Doulos, it means servant or slave. And the pi, this is the tough word, it represents the word proskuneo. Say that, proskuneo, which means worship. And what we're going to see over our series is that the life Jesus in, is inviting you to is a life that flows out of these three habits. The habit of community, the habit of service, and the habit of worship. If you want to see it in English, we've got it in English for you too. Are you ready? We've got three challenges. They're real simple. We need to get grouped. We need to serve somewhere. And we need to worship weekly. We need to get grouped. We need to find a place where we are connected. We need to serve somewhere. We need to find a place where we are living in service. And we need to worship weekly. Uh, today, we're talking about getting grouped. We're talking about Jesus' instruction to us to find people that are our people, to find people that, have, that are with us on the journey. I've been reflecting on this. I've been reflecting on what it means to not just be part of God's people, but to actually have people. You know the difference, right? 
which are kind of part of God's people, kind of feels generic. But to have people is for there to be a group of people that you know them and they know you and you're with each other and you're for each other, you know? I've been reflecting on this difference recently at several funerals that I've attended. You know, uh, preachers, we go to more funerals than most people. Uh, I don't, I'm not able to go to as many as I'd like. There are often funerals about people I care about that I can't make it to, but I, I try to go when I can. Last 18 months, I've noticed a curious thing happen. At not many of the funerals, but just a few, just enough that I noticed it. I noticed that some of the people had a posse or a crew, a gang there to remember them. I noticed it for the first time at a funeral of a, a veteran. Uh, he'd been out of the military 45 years or so. Um, and, you know, often at a veteran's funeral, there'll be official representatives of the military there, and there were for this funeral too. But that's not what struck me. What struck me was that there was this group, about seven or eight guys, all wearing their leather jackets, all covered in patches, letting you know all the things they'd done for the military. And they, they came together. They showed up early. They stayed there the whole time. They didn't go through the line and shake hands. They just sat together the whole time. Showed up early, stayed late. Finally, I asked somebody who they were. And I said, oh, those are his military buddies. They get together once a month for the last 45 years. I asked a couple of them about it. This was the first one of their little crew who had passed away. This was their first funeral. They were all old timers. They knew they had more of these coming. 45 years they'd been getting together for once a month. Went to another funeral, and uh, a little odd thing, um, not a big funeral, Pretty small family. The woman who passed away was very elderly. But there was this little crew of women knitting in the front during a whole visitation, like three hours of knitting. They showed up to the funeral, too, sat together for the funeral. Two of them knitted through the funeral. I wondered, does this family just have a higher proportion than normal of crazy ants? And that was kind of my first theory. But then I started asking around, no. This lady, when she was a young mother, had joined a knitting circle. Every Saturday morning, they got together and knit. She raised her kids while she was part of that knitting circle. She sent her kids off. She raised grandkids. She'd even welcomed in a couple great-grandkids all the while, every Saturday morning, meeting with these ladies to knit. Basically, her whole life, she had people. And there they sat, doing what they knew to do when they gathered with her. They knit. Went to a funeral. A uh, big, another one of these, kind of up in the front row. Bunch of guys in suits. They showed up early, didn't go through the line. You knew something was up. By now, I kind of knew to think, you know, what's it going to be? You know, is it their biker gang or something, you know? I go over, introduce myself. They said, oh, well, you know, the guy we're here to remember, he was a retired minister. And so are we. We're a bunch of old ministers. We get together once a week, talk about the churches we attend, to, attend now and what they're all doing wrong. So I was like, I was like, good. Glad to know some of those people are members of this church. I'm thrilled, thrilled to hear about that. That's great. Yeah. We get together once a week, and we just, and so, you know, so we're here. We're here. I've I got more of these stories. Sometimes they have a cool name. Mostly they don't. Most of the names are pretty stupid. You know, to be honest, they'll call it the old minister's group. Like, how long did it take them to think of that? You know, that's not a good name. But, but sometimes they'll have a name, sometimes they won't. But I've just seen this pattern of these people who have people. I want that. But I am not currently living a life that will get me that. Now, to be clear, I think my funeral is going to be perfectly well attended. You know, I, you know I, I think I'm a reasonably nice person, as far as I can tell most people like me. I assume some people will take some time out to come and grieve when I die. Okay, I'm not talking about the attendance at my funeral. That's not what I'm worried about. I'm saying I want that. I want part of the people. I want some of the people who attend my funeral to not just be, oh, yeah, I knew him once. I, wa I want them to be my people, you know? Who are like, yeah, we've been doing that. We're we, we're, we know each other. We know we're his people. 
I was listening to a preacher one time, kind of thinking through this same issue. He asked this question. He said, if your family couldn't do it, if your family couldn't do it, do you know who would step up to be a pallbearer at your funeral? Could they find six people who know you well enough, who are close enough to you, who are in relationship with you deep enough that they'd step up to carry your casket or to walk alongside it? Are there people who think they're your people? So I started thinking, trying to come up with six. I came up with two pretty easy, and then there was that nice guy I met in line at the grocery store. He might agree to do it. So I was working, trying to come up with my six. Then he, then, he, then he said this. He said, okay, so now if you've thought of your six, have you thought of your six? Do you know who? Are, those, are that close to you? They're your people. He says, now I'm curious, when's the last time you talked to them? When's the last time you shared a meal with them? When's the last time you were together with them? When's the last time you wept for what they're weeping for and they wept for what you're weeping for? Yeah, I was in trouble then. Because one of my people was my roommate from college. And we got together, but I'm pretty sure it was 1998. And that's getting to be a while. Do you, do you, do you know who your people are? Do you have, do, when's the last? Here's what I discovered. This question as I talked later after the sermon, this question divided the room into two big groups. Because half the people I asked, what would you think of that question he said about the casket and all that? And do you know, are you, do you still, that, that was, boy, that really was tough, wasn't it? Half the people I asked were like, no, that was stupid. What do you mean, do I have six people? I've got 20 people. Of course I have people. Doesn't everybody have people? Why would he even ask such a silly question? I've got my Sunday school class. I've got my knitting group. I've got my Tuesday morning small group. I've got the people I play tennis with every Wednesday for lunch. Who doesn't have people? And what do you mean? What does he mean? Have I seen them recently? I see them three times a week. Oh, every, doesn't everybody have people? It's, 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 a, it's a dumb question. That was half the people. The other half of people were like me. Uh, dude, I don't know. They're going to have to use one of those dolly things for me because I only came up with two people. You know, I don't have six people. And even the two people I got, I'm not even sure if I have a number for them. We might be friends on Facebook, but I haven't logged on in three years, so I wouldn't even know. It just, that question just divided the room. And here's the thing, if you're like me, if you're in the half of the room that was like, yeah, I don't know if I got six people, and even if I do, it's been a long time since I talked to my six people, here's the thing. I'm convinced that when God's people are living the life that God wants for them, then they've got people. God wants you to live a life where you've got a crew. And it's not because he's worried about who will attend your funeral. And who cares who carries your casket. It's because while you're alive, he wants you to have those people sharing life with you. Here's part of the reason I'm just so convinced of this is because half the commands of the New Testament on God's people, you couldn't even begin to follow them if you don't have people you're sharing life with. I think about Romans chapter 12. I love Romans chapter 12. For 11 chapters, Paul has been talking about how do we surrender our lives to Christ, receive salvation and fulfillment in Him, and be rescued from our sin. And then in Romans chapter 12, he turns to talk about, okay, now that we've been rescued, how do we live? Here's the way he starts. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. All right, so, so far, you could do this all by yourself. Okay, I'll give you that. Great. Read the Bible, figure out what God's will is, do it. Great. So far, all by yourself, who needs community? But then he keeps going. 
He says, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. In accordance with the faith, God has distributed to each of you, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Do you see my point? To, to the person who says, I can be a Christian without the church, I can follow, I can say yes to Jesus' call, follow me, without Christian community. Well, I think Paul would just say, no, you can't. You just can't follow Christ without the community. You can't be part of God's people unless you've got people and are in relationship to people. It can't be done on your own. And I don't mean it can't be done on your own because like you won't stick to it or you'll give up. I mean it fundamentally can't be done because the very requirements of our faith are to love one another and care for one another. He goes on, just a little lighter. He says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Well, you can't do that by yourself. How would you know what they're rejoicing about or mourning about? You can't live the life Jesus wants for you unless you are in community. And, and I want to be real clear. I just kind of want to make sure we're not missing something here. Uh, one of the struggles for some of us is that we attend a big church. And there's a lot of great things about a big church, but there are some dangers to a big church. You can let yourself think that you're fulfilling what it, God wants by saying, be in Christian community, by showing up here and sitting here with 375 other people worshiping together. But here's the thing. You cannot do the one another's of Scripture 375 at a time. Typical weekend around here, we've got like 1,300 people coming, and that's great, but you cannot Rejoice with those who rejoice for 1,300 people. You can't even learn 1,300 people's names, right? You can't mourn with 1,300 people. You can't honor one another above yourselves with 1,300 people. You've got to have your people, which means there's got to be a group you're a part of. That's some smaller... Exp Listen, I'm so glad we have the example of the early church. You know, the early church was a big church, right? Huge church, 3,000, first weekend. That's a big church. But they knew they couldn't fulfill the life Jesus wanted for them, the Kappa Delta Pi, life in God's fraternity, koinonia life, if all they did was meet in crowds. Listen to the rhythm of their life, Acts 2, 42. This is from the very beginning. This was their rhythm. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, that's koinonia, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Now right there, you might picture for yourself 3,000 people all sharing their food. And you think, how in the world did 3,000 people share their food? It's just crazy. Well, they explain in just a minute. They sold property and gave to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Well, that's where the crowd met. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I love that image. They knew if they wanted to be God's people, they needed people, 
And so it wasn't enough to just show up in the crowd at the temple. They also had to show up in homes and share a meal together. That was the context in which they took care of everyone who had need. In the context of these relationships where we could love one another and put one another first and mourn with one another and rejoice with one another. And that's exactly the church we are still called to be. The life Jesus invites us to hasn't changed. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. He says, you've got to think about this. We need to consider this. How are we going to spur one another on to love and good deeds? We need to plan for this. And then he immediately gives us one. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. He says, we need a plan so we can challenge people to love and good deeds. And he says, wait, I've got it. Don't stop meeting together. Just do that. Just keep gathering together over coffee at McDonald's or knitting at a Saturday morning or in a Sunday school class or a home Bible study or a Wednesday night class. Just get together with enough people, but not too many people, that you can know each other and love each other and care for one another and spur one another on to love and good deeds. He's saying you can't live the life Jesus wants for you without koinonia. You can't do it. You can't build a church without community. I was talking to a friend recently, and we were just reflecting on how fragile a church becomes when it doesn't have a strong sense of shared community life. A church without community life is just a church waiting to explode. Because without community life, the only thing that's left is a list of things we agree about. But here's the problem. If your connection is only as good as the list of things you agree about, I promise you, just wait five minutes, someone will add something to the list that you don't agree about. If your connection is only as strong as what you agree about and isn't a community built by shared love and mutual understanding, looking out for one another, belonging together... Well, pretty soon you'll find something that you'll disagree. You know, maybe it'll be about politics because we got Christian Democrats and Christian Republicans right here in this room. If we're not bound by community, we'll disagree about that. We'll split. Maybe it'll be about war. We got Christians who are pacifists and Christians who think war can be just right here in this room. We'll split over that. Maybe it'll be about women in ministry or worship music or how the world was made or when the world was made or how long it took or something like that. And listen, I, I promise if the only thing that holds you together is that you agree on a list. You are just waiting for the list to get one thing longer that you'll disagree about. Which is why Jesus never meant for the church to be bound by the length of our lists, but by the commitment of our love. And once we love each other, well, then we can disagree. And then go have a taco. And then move on. Because we belong to one another in love. And, and when it happens, this is the thing. I mean, here's the thing you've got to know. It isn't just that this is the life Jesus wants for you. It's also, it's the life you want for you. I, I've, I've been, been in the church a long time, grew up in the church. I've been working for churches for more than 20 years now. And, and I have discovered an almost, an almost inviolable, an almost perfect way to figure out whether a crisis will leave someone undone or make someone stronger. And it's not always the case, but, it, but it's, it's pretty, pretty reliable. Because see, crises in life, when we experience them, they feel unusual. They feel abnormal. But we've lived long enough, we know better. We know that crisis is normal. You live long enough, you'll face crisis. It'll be a divorce. It'll be your divorce or somebody else's divorce. It'll be a death, yours or somebody else's. It'll be an illness. It'll be losing your job. It'll be a, a breakup, a relationship failing that you were starting to count on. Crisis is normal. 
And when I'm talking to somebody who's facing a crisis, I've discovered one question that tells me more than anything else about whether they're prepared to face the crisis. It's this question. Are you connected in Christian community? If the answer to that question is yes, then they're almost always ready to face the crisis. And if the answer to that question is no, they almost never are. And the church needs to spring into action fast or they might be lost. Are you already connected in Christian community? I, I know people talk about getting life insurance. You know, life insurance is really for when you die, right? It's death insurance, right? I mean, so it's still a great thing. By all means, get some. But it's not life insurance. If you want life insurance, something that will actually help you navigate the chaos of life, join a small group. Be a member of a Sunday school class. Show up on Wednesday nights. And if you want life insurance, get in Christian community. I was talking to a woman... She attends this church, widowed not too long ago. I asked her if she was doing okay. That's, of course, a stupid question to ask uh, someone who's grieving, but I ask a lot of stupid questions. So she said, no, she wasn't doing okay. She was grieving, and that was a stupid question. She didn't actually say it was a stupid question. I can just tell. Then I asked her what I thought was a better question. I asked her if she needed anything. Do you need anything? You know, thinking I was going to come in and help, you know, do something. She said, no. I'm in a wonderful Sunday school class. Is this to say, what a silly question. Don't you know the Sunday school class I'm in? Of course I don't need anything. Because this Sunday school class takes care of its people. Nobody needs anything. If they tell them where, if you tell them that class, you're mourning, you're fine. They'll care, they'll take, you'll eat more, you, you'll eat better than you've eaten in years. You tell them you've got a crisis. She said, I don't know how I could make it without them. I was talking to an acquaintance of mine is two or three years back. He lost his job. He was a sharp guy. He was going to land on his feet. He was going to be okay, you know. But he didn't have much savings. He had four kids. He had a mortgage he was a little bit behind on. Things were starting to get tight. He had figured out that they weren't going to be able to send their kids to summer camp. I mean, on one hand, it's just summer camp, but they'd send them six, seven years in a row, you know. He was going to have to tell them that night. It was going to be a hard conversation. So he went to his people because he had people. He'd been drinking coffee with the same group of guys, 5.30 in the morning, one day a week for years. He went to them. He asked them to pray. Because it was going to be a hard conversation. And the Bible says, mourn with those who mourn. And he knew they would. They would mourn with him as he was mourning. They'd invited me to be part of this group several times. Um, but I'm pretty sure the Lord told me not to join the group. Either that or they met at 5.30. It was one or the other. Uh, <laughs> on reflection, I think it was the 5.30. I don't think it was the Lord. I think it was the 5.30. He told them what was going on. He went about his day. You know, they went off to work and... He went off looking for work. He had an interview scheduled that day. Got home a little bit before the kids um, did. His wife said, uh, your coffee club called. I told you, some of these crews have terrible names. Coffee club, that's the best I could think of? Anyways, okay. The coffee club called. And they paid for camp. I, I can't tell that story without tearing up. Um, but, I, but I need to explain to you why. I don't tear up when I tell that story because it's so extraordinary. Let's be clear. That isn't an extraordinary story. It's a normal story if you've got people who are your people and you've invested one coffee a week with them for week after week after a week, well, of course they're going to send your kids to camp if they can. That's what people do. The, I, I tear up when I tell that story, not because it's extraordinary. It's not extraordinary. It's, it's, it's normal. 
And we could pass a microphone around the room and some of you who have been, who've been in a Sunday school class for 30 years or you've been in a small group for five or six years or you're, maybe some of you, are, maybe you're a senior in high school, you've been with the same small group since you were in the sixth grade, you know? You could tell your story of when the crisis came and the crisis always came and God's people did what God's people always do. I don't get emotional because that story is extraordinary. It's not extraordinary. It's a very ordinary story. I get emotional because I just think about how many people are going through life without that. How many people here in this room, you show up here, some of you maybe week after week, and you sing and you worship and you wonder, why don't people know me? Why don't I have people who know me and love me and where I am known? And that's because that isn't what happens in this room. We're going to talk about proskuneo in two weeks, worship. Two weeks. That's what happens in this room. The proclamation of God's word happens in the room. But if you want to know and be known, you've got to go find your people. Because the life God wants for you is a life in relationship with others. You gotta gotta wander down the hall, just down the hall. We got all these weird rooms full of weird people, but they got people. They got people. And it's easier to be weird when you got people, right? So I just wanna say, uh, just real straight up, um, the takeaway from this sermon isn't subtle right? If you're, if you got people, right, if you're one of the people who got people, here's what I wanted to ask you to do. You double down on your people. You call your people. You take your people out to lunch. You do not give up meeting together like some people do. Don't give up. You go to Sunday school. You go to your small group. You show up for coffee. Set the alarm early. You be there. And if you got people, you figure out how to make room for more people because there are people in this church who need people and you got people. There are people not in this church who don't even know how to get to people and you got people. So you make room. You buy a bigger table. You get more chairs. If you sit at McDonald's in a booth for four, start sitting at a booth for six. Just do it. Actually, sit at a booth for six and pray that God will fill those two chairs because God will do it. If you're people who got people, then start making room for more people. The other takeaway is this. It's just real simple. If you don't have people, get in a group. In the backs of the pews in front of you, we got this little booklet. It's like 700 pages long. It lists every group in this church. Sunday school classes and small groups and Wednesday night things and recovery groups. It lists every group in this church. You grab that book, you read it, and try one. Try a couple. If the first group you go to is all filled with jerks, it's probably you. But just in case it's them, go to a different group, okay? I'm just kidding. You find a group that works. Here's the second thing I want you to do. Also in the back of your pews is this little card. I was sure I had one in my Bible. I ran up the stairs. I probably dropped it. I ran up the stairs. But somebody's going to find it and hand me one. Here it is because I don't want you to be confused. It's this thing right here. It's this thing right here. It's on the front of it. It says Koinonia Community. Go ahead and grab one and look at it. That way your neighbor doesn't feel weird because your neighbor needs one, but they're going to feel awkward if you don't grab one. So you grab one to make them feel good. On the back of it, it just says this. It just says, the life God wants for us includes koinonia, has a place for you to put some information down, and it says, I want to join a group. And then just some boxes. You're not committing yourself. You're not pro- all, the only thing that's going to happen out of this is somebody's going to get you a phone call. You're going to get a phone call from somebody say, hey, how can I help you get in a group? And you're going to tell them when you're busy and when you're not, what kind of group you're looking for, all that stuff, and they'll help you find a group. You're not promising your life away. But if you aren't in a group... Get in one now, because crisis is normal, and the means by which God wants to care for you in the crisis you're going to face next is the means of Christian community. So get in a group now. We got people uh, at the end of the service. They're going to be right up here. We got these little smiley banners and some balloons that used to be floating, but now have fallen down. Uh, Come make our sad balloons feel better. You can walk right up front, and you can give them this card, and they'll talk to you about where you can get in a group today. On the way out, turn in the card. Or just leave it on your pew. Just leave it on the pew and walk away. Somebody will come get this. Jesus walked around saying, follow me. He walked around saying, follow me. Live life like I do. That's what Jesus said. And then 
he went and got himself a crew. He had people. And they showed up at his funeral because he'd lived life with them. You need people too. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful that more than just making us a people, you in fact want to give us people relationships of meaning and purpose where we love others and we are by them loved, where we know others and we are by them known, where we serve others and we are by them served. God, this is what we want. I thank you, God, for all the people here who already have it. And I pray for everybody here who doesn't. Please, God, whatever barrier is preventing them from filling out the form or going to a kiosk and picking up a book and just doing it, whatever barrier there is, just tear it down and let them know that they are worthy of love and that there is a community that wants them and will embrace them and include them because that is who your church is. With great praise, giving you all the glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.